Now, from WYDC-TV, this is Big Fox News at 10. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Office of President of the United States. I, Kamala Davy Harris, do solemnly swear that I will well and faithfully discharge that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. The duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. A historic day on Capitol Hill as millions watched the country's 46th president, Joseph R. Biden, and Vice President Kamala Harris, who is making history as the first female, first black, and first South Asian to serve in that position, be sworn into office. Good evening, I'm Ann Emanuel. We'll have more on today's inauguration coming up, including more on the new administration's agenda. But first, we want to get to your local news. Local colleges in the Twin Tiers receiving millions of dollars in COVID relief funding. Big Fox News' Matt Kleindienst is in Corning to break down how much each college got and what they plan to do with the money. Good evening. Colleges in the area receive significant funding from the Higher Education Emergency Fund to address certain needs of their campuses. New York received $1.4 billion to assist colleges across the state. The funding comes from the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, in addition to CARES Act funding. Five colleges from the southern and northern tier received relief, each school getting between one and six million dollars. The schools could use the funds to provide financial aid and student support activities. Colleges can also use the money to cover lost revenue, technology costs associated with remote learning, and any other institutional cost. Each school is required to use a certain portion for emergency financial aid for students. I reached out to local schools in the area about the funding allocation. Elmira College got back to me saying they're still reviewing the funding requirements. Reporting from Corning, Matt Kleindens, Big Fox, WYDC. Governor Cuomo announced the Nourish New York initiative will continue into 2021. As part of his State of the State speech, Cuomo said $25 million will be funneled into programs within the initiative. $26.4 million were spent last year to buy 17 million pounds of food. Natasha Thompson says it's important that the state continues to prioritize food insecurity in the new year. We don't really anticipate that level of, of need going, uh, going down significantly anytime soon. So this Nourish New York program provides us with, you know, the resources that we need to continue doing that work. Governor Cuomo says over 1 million households received food from the program and helped more than 4,000 New York farms this past year. We've learned again that democracy is precious, democracy is fragile, and at this hour, my friends, democracy has prevailed. A historic moment in our nation's capital as President Joe Biden is sworn into office. Kamala Harris is now the first woman ever to be vice president. This year, the event looked remarkably different, but some traditions remained the same. Lauren Blanchard joins us from Washington with the latest. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris have officially begun their term. They say they want to unite the country while moving forward with their agenda. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. Thank President. You. With those words, the 46th president of the United States officially takes office. President Joe Biden sworn in by Chief Justice John Roberts and the nation's first female vice president, Kamala Harris, sworn in by Justice Sonia Sotomayor. But the new administration enters their roles with a divided nation. Politics doesn't have to be a raging fire, destroying everything in its path. We have to be different than this. America has to be better than this. And I believe America is so much better than this. This year's inauguration heavily guarded by thousands of National Guard troops and other law enforcement. About a thousand people were invited to the ceremony, mostly past and current members of Congress, family and friends, as well as former presidents Clinton, Bush and Obama and former Vice President Mike Pence. However, now former President Trump did not attend. He and the First Lady are already at home in Florida. I wish the new administration great luck and great success. I think they'll have great success. Before leaving the White House, in keeping with tradition, former President Trump left a note for his successor. As for what it says, we're told that will stay private between the two men. 
In Washington, Lauren Blanchard, Fox News. The all clear has been given after the Supreme Court received a bomb threat. A public information officer for the court says the building grounds were checked and the building was not being evacuated. An increased National Guard presence was seen at the court. The situation has returned to normal at the court building, which was closed to the public Wednesday because of the pandemic. The threat was made ahead of Biden's inauguration. Incoming White House officials say President Joe Biden is set to introduce a comprehensive immigration reform bill. It will address the millions of undocumented immigrants living in the U.S., boost border technology, and target the root causes of migration. The bill will be called the U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021. It gives an immediate pathway to citizenship for farm workers, DACA recipients, and temporary protected status holders. It also provides a plan for undocumented immigrants to eventually apply for green cards if they pass background checks and pay taxes. The Better Business Bureau is warning people to be careful when buying inauguration memorabilia online. According to the nonprofit, if you're looking for official gear, be aware that there is a lot of counterfeit merchandise being sold at lower prices. But that look-alike gear is often made with poor quality images. Also, buying online through scam websites can potentially steal your personal information. The BBB says it's received thousands of complaints regarding misleading social media ads. They advise that people think twice about buying from social media ads and to make sure any website you're on is a secure one. A U.S. Army soldier was arrested on Tuesday for allegedly attempting to help ISIS plan terror attacks. Prosecutors say 20-year-old Cole Bridges attempted to help plan an attack on the 9-11 memorial in New York City and on U.S. soldiers in the Middle East. They say in October, Bridges allegedly began communicating with an undercover FBI employee who was posing as an ISIS supporter in contact with ISIS fighters in the Middle East. Well, he's accused of sharing training guidance and advice about possible targets in New York. Bridges faces charges of attempting to provide material support to ISIS and attempting to murder U.S. military service members. A retired New York City firefighter charged with taking part in the U.S. Capitol building breach was released on a $100,000 bond on Tuesday. 53-year-old Thomas Fee of Freeport on New York's Long Island is charged with violent entry and disorderly conduct on Capitol grounds and another charge. Fee is required to turn in two guns, avoid any political gatherings, avoid the U.S. Capitol and all other state capitals, as well as undergo mental health testing. Authorities say Fee texted a selfie and a video from inside the Capitol Rotunda to his girlfriend's brother. The brother happens to be a federal agent who then turned him in. The Justice Department says Acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen is resigning today. His departure ends a month-long tenure during which Rosen kept a relatively low profile. A person briefed on the matter said Rosen withstood pressure from the White House to appoint special counsels to investigate matters President Trump wanted, such as his false allegations of voter fraud and Hunter Biden, the son of the incoming president. Monty Wilkinson is expected to be acting attorney general until Merrick Garland is confirmed. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says more than 13 million people in the U.S. have been vaccinated for COVID-19. CDC officials say about 15.7 million total doses were given out as of Tuesday morning, with more than 2 million people receiving their second dose. So far, the agency says more than 31 million doses have been distributed, but experts worry the demand for the vaccine is outpacing the supply. On Tuesday, the U.S. marked a grim milestone, reaching more than 400,000 deaths since the start of the pandemic. The College Board is dropping the SAT's optional essay and subject tests. The organization says it's because of changing needs of students and colleges. The subject tests will still be offered for international students in May and June. The SAT essay will be available to take through June. Many schools have temporarily dropped requirements for college readiness exams because of the pandemic. Harvard and the University of Pennsylvania aren't requiring the SAT and ACT this year. The University of California system has suspended them until at least 2024. For years, lawmakers have tried to end a state holiday known as Confederate Heroes Day. The day immediately follows Martin Luther King Day, and some say it's past time it was ended. Shannon Ryan has that story. I am a proud American and certainly a proud Texan. 
but it does, that does not mean that I have to be proud of its horrible past. Since 1973, state workers have received the day after Martin Luther King Day off with pay. The reason, a holiday, Confederate Heroes Day. There is no reason to celebrate the Confederacy at all. For years, lawmakers like Jarvis Johnson have fought unsuccessfully to eliminate this holiday. But given the momentum the Black Lives Matter movement saw in 2020 and the events of 2021, he has hope for House Bill 36. We only have to look at what happened at the United States Capitol recently to see what it means to have insurrection, just like we had 160 years ago. Austinite Jacob Hale has been calling to eradicate the holiday since he was just 13. Today, a 19-year-old college student, he continues to fight. The Confederates were not heroes. They far surpassed the constitutional definition of treason. They killed hundreds of thousands of their fellow Americans. Their motivation, in their own words, was to preserve the servitude of the African race. These traitors are, in fact, some of the greatest villains in American history. State Representative James White, a U.S. Army veteran, agrees with much of this. He says he won't celebrate the holiday, but he also won't support legislation to eliminate it. When you are a soldier, when you have taken that oath, uh, your oath is at that time to that constitution and obviously honoring your oath. On Tuesday, Confederate Heroes Day, legislation to remove Confederate monuments from Texas state capitol grounds was also introduced. White says he won't support that either. Every monument on the state grounds, you could you could come up with some reason uh, why it's, it has a, 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 an odious uh, nature. Still ahead tonight, help is on the way for millions of small businesses still struggling to make ends meet during the pandemic. But there are several key changes to the Paycheck Protection Program that business owners should know about. We'll explain what will be different about applying this time around. Here's your local stock market update from Big Fox. Now, your Twin Tiers forecast from Big Fox. Tonight's Big Fox forecast is brought to you by William Matar. Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Kim Walker with your weather update. Much colder day today with temperatures about 5 to 10 degrees cooler than yesterday. 7 degrees cooler in Watkins Glen and Bath around 7 degrees as well. Cooling 7, 8 in Elmira and Ithaca about 12 degrees cooler that's because of those northwest winds and it's been gusty all day. Even though we did manage to get up to around 30 degrees in some locations, it felt like the teens out there just because of that brisk wind. Tomorrow, there's another system that will be diving south where the low pressure system coming out of Canada and it will move to the southeast. It will spread some showers down to our area, but most of us will only see a few flurries. But the big story for tomorrow will also be the winds because it's going to make things feel about 10 degrees cooler. So we start off around 26 degrees in the morning. If you're shoveling, you are definitely going to have to bundle up early in the day. 34 degrees at 10, but feeling like 21. And although we climb up to around 39 degrees at 2 o'clock, it's going to feel like 26. And temperature readings will be mainly in the 30s through the rest of the afternoon and into the evening hours. What about snowfall? forecast. Well, it looks like for the next couple of hours, not a lot going on, but then uh, by the four or five in the morning, there will be a few flurries uh, as we start off the day tomorrow, and then that should start to taper off late in the morning into the early afternoon. And then Thursday night into early Friday, we are expecting a few snow showers by midnight. It looks like some snow showers in Hornell and Bath, possibly even in Corning and Elmira. And then as we fast forward this to about six o'clock in the morning, it looks like we start to see a little bit drier conditions in Corning and Elmira. The heaviest snow will be to our west. And then off and on flurries and a few snow showers throughout the day on Friday into midnight on Saturday. So there will be some snow that's gonna be flying around 
for the next 24 to 48 hours. Right, as far as snowfall estimates from now through about noon on Friday, it looks like maybe uh, three quarters of an inch in Ithaca could be possible. It looks like maybe just a trace in Shimon County as well as in Steuben, but near Hornell, about half an inch could be possible and a lot more than that as we move to the west. It looks like in Olean about 1.25 inches and down to the east in Binghamton, maybe three quarters of an inch. So there will be a little bit of snow to go around in the next couple of days. It's going to be cold tonight as we plunge down to around 20 degrees in Corning and 22 in Elmira. Highs tomorrow only around 39 in Elmira, but it looks like about 40 degrees in Corning as well as in Watkins Glen. Cloudy conditions, breezy all day long, so it's going to make those temperatures feel about 10 degrees cooler. We plunge down into the 20s over the weekend with snow ending. Another round comes our way on Monday with a high around 31 degrees. Help is on the way for millions of small businesses still struggling to make ends meet. The Paycheck Protection Program is now back open for small businesses. Entrepreneurs around the country, they've had to adapt and learn how to survive in this tough pandemic environment. But applying this time around may be a little different. Mandy Gaither explains in today's Consumer Watch. Applications now open. The Payment Protection Program is back, and that means small businesses can once again apply for a new, potentially forgivable federal loan. We have worked with uh, the PPPs last time. We will probably look into it again this time, absolutely. It's a big help, no question about it. We're thrilled that it's out there. This time around, PPP reopened with some key changes. The maximum loan is now $2 million compared to the previous $10 million. You can get a first loan if you haven't received one before or even a second loan. However, not every business is eligible for a loan this time. Businesses must show they lost revenue by at least 25% in any quarter of 2020 compared to the same quarter of 2019. For hard-hit restaurants and businesses across the country, relief can't come soon enough. It's been hard for a lot of small businesses. I think small music venues in particular have been hit really, really hard. This new round of applications is possible due to the latest COVID relief package signed into law in December. That legislation included $284 billion for additional lending to eligible businesses, including those that already received a loan months ago. The bill includes measures aimed at making loans more available to micro businesses. We've managed to survive for nine months already, which is uh, to itself pretty amazing. A family sharing their heartache tonight after losing their father, but they're also celebrating and honoring the man who battled so hard but lost that battle with cancer just hours after being there for his daughter's wedding. Here's Kevin Hogan. After experiencing breathing problems Christmas Day, Juan Estella was admitted to Middlesex Hospital. Tests revealed he had terminal cancer. And his wish to walk his daughter Sarah down the aisle on her wedding day in May to Michael wouldn't happen. I wanted something fairy tale like. <laughs> well, I wanted something fairy tale like. <laughs> As Juan's health continued to fail, Sarah made her dad's dream come true on Saturday. Her gown was a yellow PPE along with masks and gloves. It's just having him there is what mattered to me. With the minister, friends, and family on Zoom, the bride and groom said, I do. Sarah's sister, Alyssa Bro, witnessed the exchange of vows from her car via Zoom. Come on, they just got married next year. I was just so overcome with joy that, you know, again, that Middlesex was able to do this. In a statement, Middlesex Hospital spokesperson Amanda Falcone said it was our privilege to care for Juan and to help him attend his daughter's wedding. Our hearts go out to Juan's family and we wish the newly married couple all the best. Sarah's mom, Lisa, was once married to Juan. As soon as we all said amen, Juan opened his eyes. His eyes got big. He opened his eyes and he's like, wow, Sarah got married. Wanted something small and meaningful, but everyone that mattered to me most to be there. A dream has come true for a teen in Fresno County, California. That teen becoming an Eagle Scout this past weekend. The difference is this Eagle Scout is a teen girl, not a boy. Gilbert McGallan has the story. At just 14 years old, Amanda Bales of Clovis is blazing trails. Saturday, she was awarded the highest rank by the Boy Scouts of America Sequoia Council. 
from Madeira to Kings Counties. Amanda is the first female to reach the status of Eagle Scout. I thought it was a dream at first, and then I know it was reality. But instead of pinching herself, a collection of awards remind her that it's real. It has my mentor pins and my parents pins and um, my, my little badge. Amanda's following in the footsteps of her older brother, but she's forged her own path and she's exceeded so many expectations along the way. I wanted to prove to him that and all the people, all the naysayers that girls can do it. They can do anything that boys can do and sometimes they can do it better. This achievement was two years in the making. To climb the ranks, Amanda assumed different leadership positions and even spent a night in the woods alone. And you get like next to no food. <laughs> which was a big challenge for me because I love to eat. She also had to work on a final project. With the help of others in Troop 60, she created eight of these boxes to rehome animals impacted by the creek fire. Half of them will be for barn owls and the other half for bats. Wild turkeys are attacking the owls and bats need um, spots so they can sleep at night. Amanda now wants to mentor other scouts as a way to give back to the community who helped her break the mold. In Fresno County, Gilbert Maggione, ABC 30 Action News. The third oldest person in Scotland got a special birthday present. Marion Dawson turned 108 on Tuesday. She also got her first COVID-19 vaccination shot. Born in 1913, Dawson has seen quite a bit. Two world wars, the Spanish flu, and now the coronavirus pandemic. Meanwhile, Scotland's first minister extended the country's lockdown that's now in place until mid-February. Pet owners would do just about anything for their furry friends. We introduce you to one couple in Maine who've gotten quite creative for their feathered ones. Owen Kingsley has their story. <laughs> as soon as I come out, yeah. they hear me and they're just so loud. They're like, oh, she's coming. This household is home to two quirky pets, Rye and Malfi, a pair of ducks. And their owners, April and Sean Sousa and Corinna, go above and beyond your average pet parent. Rye is named after his condition, Rye Neck, causing him trouble holding his own head up. But that didn't stop April and Sean from bringing him home. I'm not going to turn down you know, animal that needs help. Rye also has a weight issue that puts stress on his legs, causing him to lose balance when he walks. He wasn't catching himself, so he's kind of like toppling over. So I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I was looking on ideas online and found, you know, I found chicken wheelchairs. So I'm like, I bet I can do that with ducks. So she did out of some basic pipes, some wheels and a converted dog harness. It's kind of a physical therapy thing, so until I can see that he can walk on it without having troubles. So he's definitely so strengthened up just the past three days of using it. You, go. you are mobile, buddy. And now Rye can go wherever Malfi goes together. <laughs> They're my babies. I couldn't imagine my life without them. <laughs> Owen Kingsley, WABI, TV5 News, Corinna. We want to leave you with a smile tonight. Reunited with his best friend, Master Sergeant Hector Rivera just returned from deployment in Kuwait and his dog was so excited to see him. The six-year-old pit bull Cano wagged his tail a mile a minute. Cano was being fostered through Dogs of Deployment. It's a program where families volunteer to house dogs while their owners are deployed for work. While Rivera was overseas, Cano learned tricks like closing the door and answering commands in Spanish but nothing beats seeing his owner for the first time since last June. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great night.